continuing our presentation of Suwannee County history. Last month, this month, and next month, we're looking at the period between 1900 and 1920. There's a little bit of overlap between the, the presentations, but I try to do chronologically, but sometimes it's just more of a, a topical discussion. So we've got a little bit of that this time, and I think next time also. But we kind of will pick up where we left off last month with a map of Suwannee County in 1907. You will see that there are a lot less communities being listed in uh, this map. And that's because of automobiles are starting to come in. People are being able to buy automobiles and there is no longer the need for communities ever, every you know, two, three, four, five miles. And so a lot of these small communities are dying off. You, you've got uh, still major locations, of course, like Livebo, Houston, uh, even Rixford is there, McAlpin O'Brien. Uh, Lurville is not listed on this map, but it's still there. But all those little communities that used to be around it that had sprung up during the phosphate boom in the 1880s, 1890s, uh, had already disappeared by this point. So we, we've got a lot of people moving into the larger communities as automobiles become more and more frequent. And also as more railroads come in, it's easier to travel from one location to the other. Live Oak especially is getting a lot of that growth. We talked about, I believe, last month that Live Oak was the fifth largest city in the state for a few years. It was between that and Miami and Live Oak won. But they still were using basically a borrowed city hall, even at that point. So finally, in 1908 and completed in 1909, they have a new city hall that is built. So for the past 30 years, <coughs> since Live Oak had been incorporated in 1878, not established like some of these signs say, Live Oak was incorporated in 1878. But from that point on, they used a variety of locations where they held their city council or town council, later city council meetings. The original meeting was held at the Swanee County Courthouse. That'd be the old wooden courthouse that's no longer there, not the one we have today. So they had that at the Swanee County Courthouse. And then in 1886, they decided to rent from John F. White uh, his building or part of his building, uh, the southwest corner of it, one of the rooms. And that is in the what was called the White Basden block at the time. That is still in existence. It is just north of the courthouse. It's those two brick buildings. One of them is Rhett Buller's office, and the other is the uh, public defender's office. So the public defender's office, basically, that was uh, part of Mr. Basden's property. Mr. White had the other one, or vice versa. Anyway, it was in that, that area right there where they held city council or town council meetings for uh, a couple of years. They paid $48 per year for rent. Woo, no big deal. <laughs> big bucks. But in 1888, they decided to move back to the county courthouse. Maybe Mr. Bazer and Mr. White needed more property or more space. But for whatever reason, they decided to start holding it at the county courthouse. And that was in January of 1888. But a couple months later, they moved again. They, they are moving around. And one thing I want to point out, and I'll mention later on the presentation is, as you go through the city council minutes, which I've been doing again for another purpose here in the last week or two, you have a lot of turnover from the foundation of the town as an established and incorporated in 1878. You've got a lot of turnover of the officials. It's very rare for somebody, an alderman as they were called at the time, to actually finish a term. Or the city, the, the town marshal, or the town clerk, or the town tax collector. It just was odd if they finished their term of office. And so you've got a lot of turnover. And I don't know if politics was involved in all these moves from one location to another or something else, but it's just, there's a lot of turmoil that you see in the 1870s, 1880s, uh, with especially the town of Live Oak, but even Swanee County was dealing with some of that in the 1870s with reconstruction. But anyway, uh, be that as May in 1888, March, they decided to meet in the old storehouse of H.F. Dexter. H.F. Dexter was one of the richest men in town. His father had been the largest slave owner in Suwannee County prior to the Civil War. Uh, Mr. Dexter owned several buildings in the downtown Live Oak area. Um, his house was one of the biggest houses, if not the biggest house in town. That was on Duval Street. But he had several storehouses. His old building was wooden. His new one that he built in the 1880s was brick. Uh, and so they were using the old building and that's what they decided to do. 
and that was on Connor Street. It would have been facing the railroad, um, close to where Love Inc. is, I think just, just east of that, if I recall correctly. So they did that for a little while, but, but not for long, because then they, just a few months later, decided to start renting space from Mrs. Nancy Parshley. And they only did that for a few months. Until 1889, they decided to secure the use of a building that was owned by Mr. Gus Potsdammer, who we will talk about in a lot more detail later on in this presentation. But they rented the hall from Mr. Potsdammer. And let's see, I don't have a price on that one. Mrs. Parshley's was $4 a month, so that would still be the $48 a year. Big bucks. And they did that, but let's see. Da, 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 da. They stayed at Mr. Potsdammer's place for about three years, and then they decided to use the meeting room of H.K. Lewin for $4 per month. And the minutes, it's interesting how the minutes are worded, they uh, were told, the, the clerk and treasurer, who was S.J.Y. at the time, he was told to return the keys of the council meeting room to Mr. Potsdammer and explain to him why the town could no longer rent his room. The minutes don't say why. <laughs> but that's when the minutes were like one paragraph. That was old days meeting. But I wish they'd tell, told the reason why. But Mr. Lewin, H.K. Lewin, they're now the city council or town council still this time, is renting that space from him. Mr. Lewin is also a, a town alderman, a town councilman. So uh, today that probably would not fly. Different times, though. Different times. So they rented for a couple more years. In 1894, the Masonic, um, the, the Masons of the area decided to build a Masonic Lodge, Masonic Temple, a wooden two-story building that was built across the street from this picture you're seeing now. They built it in 1894, and later on that year, they offered the use of the building for $50 per year. So they went from $48 to $50 per year. And the town council accepted that. And so that's where they met for the next, basically, 15 years almost. Well, meanwhile, as I've already mentioned, Live Oak became one of the largest cities in the state. They were still renting part of the Masonic Temple, Masonic Lodge is building. Uh, it just wasn't good enough. It just did not meet the requirements because that building was also being used not only by the Masons, but also uh, for the Episcopal Church services. It was also where the Swanee Rifles, our local militia unit, which later became the National Guard, that's where they had their stuff. So you've got several different entities renting and using this one two-story wooden building. And the town, and by this point in 1908, 1909, we are now a full-fledged city in Live Oak. They need to provide more services. They need to provide more space. The fire department has been renting space basically on the courthouse grounds. They've got a little shed, and that's the fire department. They need space for all these municipal uh, entities, the fire department, the police department, and whatnot. And so in 1908, 1909, the city builds this city hall. At the time, there were at least 3,000 residents in Live Oak. A couple of funny things about the construction of it. Uh, it was built by the firm of Peavy and Walker, or Walker and Peavy. Uh, Mr. Walker, Paul Walker, was, I think, 28 when they started designing the building, 30 when it was finished. Uh, so he was, he was young. This was the only public building he is known to have designed and then his partner, uh, Mr. Peavy, James Peavy, this is the only public building he is known to have built. He built a few homes in Live Oak, but they were both local builders, or local folks. It was built using local materials. And again, this is the only public building these guys built. Uh, Mr. Walker, the architect, uh, moved a couple years later to New Mexico for his health. He died about five years later, so he was only in his mid-30s when he died. But the, the building was sound. Renovations over the years to uh, take into account the expansion of city services up until 1978 when they needed to build a new city hall. And so they constructed the current one on White Avenue. The old city hall continued to be used as the fire department and the police department until they moved out into their own buildings in the 1990s and then the 2000s. It was renovated again in the 2000s using grant funds, like a historical renovation, and now the Chamber of Commerce uses that building. You've still got the second floor, the uh, City Council Chamber meeting rooms available for rent or for use by other people. It's a nice place. Um, I go there, I won't say regularly, but I'm there several, several times a year for various meetings. Um, but it's, it's a nice building. It's weird. It, it, 
as far as I can tell, anybody else can tell it never had a clock. It looks like there'd be a clock, but you have the county courthouse, you know, a block or two away, and in case the time got off, that might have gotten confusing, so they didn't do that. What they did do is they had different bells, though, for fires, and I, I've got lists in some of the old, uh, I was going to say song books, the old phone books and such that tell you about what it meant. So if you were a fireman or if you knew anything about the fire department, by listening to the, the whistles, the bells and whistles kind of thing that was going on, you knew exactly where the fire was. If you couldn't see the smoke, you, you knew where to go. There was a whole system laid out, and uh, it's just interesting some of the little quirks of the building. But it's still sound, it's still in use today. And again, built by a young architect who never designed another building, and built by a contractor that never built any other public buildings. So, uh, Live Oak City Hall. 1909, that same year as the completion of the old City Hall, there was a convention. The war had been over for over 40 years by that point, almost 45 years, and the gentlemen are getting older. And every year there would be a state convention, different locations around the state. 1909 was Live Oak's turn. And so thousands of people came from all over the state, and really all over the southeast, came back uh, to Live Oak to uh, honor those who had died, and honor those who had served in the Civil War. This is a picture of downtown Live Oak looking south. You can see the county courthouse uh, clock tower there in the, the top right. You can see the white base the block there on the, the extreme right. Uh, and these are just some of the veterans that came back. Now, one of the questions I get asked, I don't know how many times every year, is about that monument, which was in downtown Live Oak, Ohio, and Howard, right there at the intersection. People ask me all the time, where is that? First of all, they assume it's marble, and they ask where that marble statue is, or that marble monument. Well, I hate to tell it to them, but I tell them, it was not marble, it was just wood and plaster, and it was built just for that purpose, for that convention, and it was torn down. So it no longer exists, but it does look like a, a marble obelisk or something. But anyway, lots of people showed up, lots of people. Got a couple pictures of it. This is a view from the White Basin block, actually Red Bullard's office today, looking roughly north, northeast. There's the newly completed city hall up there in the, the top, uh, but you can see the throngs of people coming through downtown Live Oak. Lot, lots of people. You see the telegraph wires, you see the power lines, all kinds of stuff. All these major buildings downtown had sidewalk, covered sidewalks and stuff too, which is something different. Here's another picture looking roughly south. Not so good of a picture. And I think I've got yeah, one more showing some of the local veterans of the Civil War. County Courthouse, the, the front porch portico, whatever you call it, is there. The Swanee Hotel, which was completed in 1908, there's the, the front portico of that too. So different pictures of this convention it was lots of people coming. Bridges in Swanee County. This is, I, I, I love, Bridge building in Swanee County in three different eras, and we're starting the fourth one, I think. But definitely three eras. You've got the original vehicle bridge building of this era that we're looking at today, and last month and this, uh, this coming month. But between 1900, 1902, and about 1920, you've got that first really big uh, construction boom of, of vehicle bridges in Swanee County. Then you've got another boom that starts in the 30s and goes through the late 40s, more or less. And then you've got a third one that's in the 70s and early 80s. So that, those are times of a lot of bridges being built because they're meeting their lifespan. It, it, it's, it's time to replace them. But this is the first one of the major ones anyway that I know of that is built. You've got, even as these, these are being built, the beginning of it, you've still got a lot of horses, a lot of wagons, people that are traveling, not in automobiles, and this is the first one that I know of, 1902, the, the Swanee Springs Bridge, built by uh, Virginia Bridge and Iron Company. When people see this picture, they usually wrongly assume that it is the bridge that is there today. It's not it. 
it's not in because it's in the wrong direction. This is Swanee Springs, this is the enclosure that's still there today, and this is looking roughly east. The one that's still there is up over here to the, the northwest. So, but you're not the only one, trust me. More people than not assume it. And it looks very similar if you just glance at it. But this was the first one built in 1902, just to the east of the actual uh, springs. If you go out to the springs today, you will see, not the bridge because it's not there anymore, but you will see the uh, support structures over on the Hamilton County side to this side. And on the Swanee County side, you will see, let's see, one of the pillars has collapsed, one of the columns has collapsed, and I think one is still up. I'm trying to remember now, but you will see them just to the east of the spring itself. But uh, that one was built in 1902. That kind of, as far as I can tell, started off that vehicle bridge building process. And like I said, really, this was before the vehicles were around. Um, there might have been a couple people in Florida that had a, a vehicle at this point. Some of them probably from Live Oak. Um, several folks. Mr. Dowling probably had one about this time. Um, let's see who else. Captain Hillman would have had one by this point. Mr. Porter, George Porter would have had one probably by this point or the year after. And you can see how this is the horse and buggy that's crossing it. That was original US 129 as it crossed the river. So that one's built, 1902. And this is the first one in Lauraville, built in 1907, built by the Converse Bridge Company. And you will see basically most of these bridges are built by the same one or two or three companies, most of them Converse builds. At the courthouse, I've got some of these blueprints even now uh, from this original era of bridge building, kind of interesting. If I had time this morning, I was going to get them, I just didn't have time. But they look very similar. You know, all these you're going to see are very similar designs. But this is the one in Lurville built in 1907. It was built at the same time as the Branford Bridge and built by the same company. Now, and this is something I really didn't pay attention to until last week. Notice double pillars here, double columns, single column. And then on the other side is a double column also. This was a turning bridge. Steamboats were still up and down the river at this point. And so this one and the, and the next one I'm going to show you, they're, they're turn, turnables. I don't know how they turned. Don't ask me that because I haven't figured that out yet. But they are turn bridges. So you've got the, the spans that are uh, connecting on the, the, the banks, but then you've got that center structure that turns. So that's the one down at Lauraville. And then you see the one built at the same time by the same company, uh, the Branford Bridge, built by the Converse Bridge Company. And this one, too, is a turning bridge, which I knew that one because I found records saying it. But you can see double column, double column, one big single column, and you can see how the turning stuff is on there. So this would swivel. And it's obvious that it would be a swivel one if the Lauraville one was, because what's the point of having a swivel one at Lauraville if you don't have one at Branford? Because you're going to get the steamboat up there. So this one was also a swivel uh, bridge. Very interesting. It's a little bit different design because it's wider. Oh, yeah. This picture was taken in 1925. The ironic thing is, and we know hindsight's 2020, if the counties had waited just five years longer to build these bridges, they would not have needed to make them turning because steamboats stopped steaming within a few years of their construction. So they could have saved a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of uh, engineering if they had just waited a few years. But again, high size 2020, they would have never known at this point. One of the other bridges built during this period, this is at the Swanee River State Park, or Ellaville as it was called at the time, that area, built in 1908 by the Converse Bridge Company. So yet another one built by Converse. The vehicle bridge is on the left. The right bridge is the railroad bridge, which was basically uh, the successor railroad bridge to the, at least two or three before that that had been built, uh, the first one in 1861. So you've got these two bridges close together. Now this embankment right here, this, this concrete stone block embankment still exists today. 
If you go to the state park, you can see it. For many years, it was mislabeled as the old railroad bridge, but it's actually the old vehicle bridge. And it was there for, uh, I've got some documentation in the courthouse where it was asked, somebody was asking to have it torn down in, I think, 1932, because it was a hazard to navigation, especially when it was flooded. So they wanted it torn down. So that was another bridge built in this era that we're looking at, just in this 15 uh, year period, more or less. Yet another one, this one here, Nobles Ferry Bridge, constructed in 1911 by the Roanoke Bridge Company. Now this picture is taken 40 plus years later, 1952, um, it's a little worse for wear. Um, you can see the wood overlaid the original wood, which is rotting. I should have put a picture in there. Put another picture that zooms in showing the rotting wood. But this was again 40 years later, and this again it is a similar design to those other ones. It's uh, an iron frame with wood flooring, just like these other ones we've been looking at. So the Noble Ferry Bridge, used for many, many years. By this point, um, Swanee and Hamilton, which is on the other side, they were posting a you know drive over at your own risk kind of thing. And several of these bridges, that's what they were doing before they were uh, retired. The Louisville Bridge, the same thing starting in the, I think, the 30s. They were starting to post those kinds of signs saying, drive at your own risk. And the Louisville Bridge was not replaced until 1947. This one took a whole lot longer to be replaced. Unfortunately, people kept using it. And um, one day in 1969, a guy in a semi decided to drive over it. And it didn't quite make it. Oh, yeah, wow. he collapsed. He collapsed the build, the, the whole structure. I think he survived, but the whole bridge collapsed. Again, you know, drive at your own risk when you see. He was trying to make a shortcut, take a shortcut. Problem is, because this bridge collapses before a new one is being built, people that are wanting to come from Hamilton to Swanee in that area have to take like a 20-mile route to get into one of the other bridges that's still in existence. <clears throat> so, unfortunately, that one was used much longer than it should have been. And that's what happens. So 1969, again, I've gotten ahead of myself in our history, but I figured I'd show you that's what happens when you use a bridge a little bit longer than you should. But there were other bridges, bridges that were being built. This one here is Dowling Park. Now I've had records, and I think I've even stated myself that it was built in 1906. And I'm not sure where I got that information from. It's probably second or third hand from something or somebody. But that's not the case. They started talking about one by 1906. They almost built one in 1906. Uh, they actually had uh, in that year and successor years, they bid out the, the project. They even selected an engineer and a, uh, a company to build it several times, but they kept going back and forth. According to the county commission minutes, it was not actually built and completed until 1913, which probably is the year this picture was taken. So 1913, they tried for 10 years basically to get a bridge built here. And for one reason or the other, it took him until 1913. This name here, Dubose, you will see his name a few times mentioned later on in this presentation. Um, he was a photographer. He had a studio, uh, Dubose Studios. He did a lot of photographs of Live Oak in Swanee County around 1913, 1914 especially. And I'm sure there were other years, but, but I've got copies of ones from the, that era. So it makes sense this was done in 1913. You can see back here, if you look closely, the old railroad bridge of uh, the Lavo Period and Gulf, as it was at that point. And that bridge was used again into the 1940s or so when they replaced it, or the 50s even, when they replaced it by the bridge that was just recently replaced, which I'm thinking might be the start of a fourth generation or fourth era of bridge building in Swanee County. Other bridges built during this era we're looking at. Rocky Creek Bridge, built 1903 by Virginia, uh, bridge and Iron Company. You've got the Scotts Ferry Bridge, which was built over the Santa Fe River, going into what is now Gilchrist County. That one was completed in 1911 by the Roanoke Bridge Company. 
And then there was a bridge over the Chattanooga River near, Hil near Hildreth, which was completed in 1909 by the Converse Bridge Company. So again, all these pretty much look the same. Very similar design. Iron structure, wooden, wooden flooring, and in this case, wooden rails. Even though we had all these bridges being built, we still had a few ferries, not near as many as we had, but we still had a couple ferries for, for many decades later until they decided, eh, we'll just start using the, the free bridges. Why well, keep paying for a ferry crossing when I just drive down the road a little bit and go on a bridge? So you've got these bridges being built. Meanwhile, you still have steamboats. Less and less, but you still have steamboats up and down the Suwannee River. Now, the 1896 hurricane, that was kind of the, the end of the, the glory day, the end of the golden era of steamboating on the Suwannee River. But there were still steamboats. It wasn't like they all stopped. Several of them went and moved to other areas, but we still had several steamboats on the Suwannee River past that point. Uh, Captain Magruder, who owned the Independent Navigation Company, he brought in a steamboat named Fetus, 97 feet long, 19 and a half feet wide. She was 61 tons. And uh, one deck vehicle, uh, one deck vessel, Dan McQueen worked on her. Dan McQueen we talked about a few months ago, the mulatto uh, pilot uh, who worked for Captain Ivy, Robert Ivy. But anyway, she steamed uh, starting in about 1898 on the Swanee River. Up until really 1913, uh, she was more or less scrapped at that point. So she, she was on the river for about 15 years. That's not Stevens, by the way. That is a different one which is the city of Hawkinsville, or the city of Hawkinsville of Tampa. You can sometimes, I think that's what it says on here, actually. Yeah, city of Hawkinsville of Tampa. The last steamboat really brought on uh, the, the river. She was built in 1896. She was 141 feet long, so much bigger than a lot of the other steamboats, and she was 319 tons. I think she was, well, she was one of the largest, if not the largest steamboat that operated on the Swanee River. She was the last one to operate on the Swanee River. Uh, built 1896, she moved to the Swanee River in 1900. One of her main jobs, beyond bringing ice up to Louisville, was to move cedar trees, both in Cedar Key, up and down the river, those pencil factories that they use those trees for. She would steam up and down the river dealing with that, or steam out in the Swanee, outside of the mountain Swanee River in the Gulf operating in conjunction with Cedar Key. Um, she continued running on the river until about 1914, when she was kind of abandoned at her, uh, the dock and allowed to sink. Ironically, one of the last things that the steamboat was used for was to bring railing for a bridge down around Old Town. Uh, that helped to speed up her demise. So it's always kind of ironic that this steamboat, the last of her kind on the river, brought her successor, basically. What made her obsolete and not economically feasible to use. So very interesting. But even though she's the last one operating on the Swanee River, she's not the only one in those last years. Another one was called the Three States, owned by the Swanee River Steamboat Company. She was 140 feet long, so she was only a foot shorter than City of Hawkinsville, uh, but 300 and, what did I say? 319 tons versus 126 tons. So this one's, even though it's about the same length, is a lot smaller uh, weight-wise, displacement-wise, than uh, City of Hawkinsville. She operated only for a few years till like 1901, so about only about a two, three-year period in the early 1900s. And then she went over to Apalachicola River, which was much more profitable still at that point. It was harder to get a bridge across there. So we've gotten that. And so if you've got more railroads coming in, you've got more automobiles coming in, it just is no longer economically feasible to use steamboats. You can do a whole lot quicker, a whole lot cheaper those other ways. So gradually those steamboats were moved to other locations, they were abandoned, uh, they sank, and so by the mid-teens, you've got no more steamboats on the Swanee River. And uh, this is a picture of the city of Hawkinsville, which is a, what is it, a state underwater archaeological preserve, I think is what they call it. So you can still go, if you're a diver, you can go just south of the bridge at Old Town, 
you can go dive on her remains. So an era that had been going on basically for 75 years that had brought so much commerce into Suwannee County and the surrounding areas uh, ended it in this era that we're talking about, uh, just replaced by bigger and better things. Kind of sad to see them go. It'd be nice to see them again, but with our bridges as they are, they're not turning bridges. Uh, I was joking a few months ago, the uh, county economic director and I were talking semi-seriously about you know, getting a steamboat back on the river for entertainment purposes, for you know, historical rides, but, but then I realized you have to do something because the bridges are too low. You wouldn't be able to steam very far or make things where they, the, the funnels hinge or whatever. I'm just not sure we can ever get to that point again. And in a way, that's kind of sad. Also speaking of sad, in 1911, June 13th, Thomas Dowling, we've been talking about him for the last few months, he passes away at the age of 60 and is buried in the Live Oak Cemetery. Here he is with some of his grandsons. Um, they look like they're all wearing belts with guns on them. Maybe not the guns part. Uh, maybe they're playing cowboys and Indians. And he must be the Indian. But he had done a lot of good for Swanee County and Live Oak and Dowling Park, obviously. Before his passing, in the years preceding it, uh, some of his family were very big, such as the R.L. Dowling and Sons Lumber Company. That had started out as a short line railroad, basically for timber, in conjunction with their sawmill. It started in Live Oak and moved westward until he got to a place called Hudson upon the Suwannee on the Suwannee River. And gradually as uh, it was expanding, these other major railroads, the SAL, Seaboard Airline, and the ACL, the Atlantic Coast Line, uh, were willing and dealing and, and trying to uh, compete with each other and compete with some of the smaller ones. And so gradually uh, they work out some backroom deals and what's called the Live Oak and Prairie Railroad is established on September 23rd, 1903. So that's kind of established based upon R.L. Dowling and Sons Lumber Company. Well, the ACL wants to get involved. They want to get in, in, into this area. But they're kind of limited by some old agreements that they had signed. So they use uh, the Dowling's uh, short line, and, and they go around uh, it by making another charter, because the LOP in, uh, charter, that one is faulty. They realize there's something wrong with it. So they, in 1906, incorporate the live oak Perry and Gulf Railroad, the LOP and G Railroad. Basically, they take over the assets of the LO and P, the Live Oak and Perry. And as we've talked about before, there's also a Live Oak and Gulf. So there's a Live Oak and Gulf, Live Oak and Perry, Live Oak and Perry and Gulf Railroad. It's hard to keep track of them, trust me. So they establish it in 1906, and they go all the way past, just past Perry, eventually. Um, let's see, some notes. Trying to go through the successor that's still owned by a successor line, lots of different ones, but we'll talk about that at some other point, I guess. Um, because they've got a competitor, the Florida Railway. Now, then that one was part of the Live Oak and Gulf, which had been incorporated from uh, the holdings of the Live Oak, Louisville, and Dead Man's Bay Railroad in 1895. So the Drew family, Frank Drew, because his father had passed away, George Drew had passed away by this point. Frank Drew, one of the two sons of Governor uh, Drew, was heavily invested in this railroad. And so they purchased the and merged the Suwannee and San Pedro Railroad in 1905 and formed the Florida Railway. Lots of backroom deals, lots of competition, lots of backstabbing is going on. It's, I'm not gonna get into all of it, because there's a guy named Don Hensley, and he, uh, www.taplines.net, he writes a ton about, not just this railroad, but a lot of other railroads. But basically, we'll talk more about it next month, but the Florida Railway meets its demise because of partly Frank Drew's stubbornness and not wanting to, to will and deal with certain folks, some of the bigger railroads, and competing with the Dowling's Railroad. So, at this point in our history, as we're talking about, we've got these two regional railroads that have been built, been established. Speaking of bridges, as we were talking about earlier, 
the uh, turning bridge that is located between Louisville and Brantford. That turning bridge at, is at a place called Wilmarth. It was part of the Florida Railway. So that is one existing portion of Florida Railway that is still there. But again, we'll talk about these two railroads more next month. Meanwhile, you've got other businesses coming into Swanee County, and especially Live Oak. One of them is the Citizens Bank. Citizens Bank is established in 1907. J.B. Barton is the president. Arnold Mickler is the cashier. Uh, it is housed in this building, which you may recognize as what's now Red Bullard's office, part of that white based in block. Again, one of the first brick buildings in Live Oak, built 1884. Those two buildings, this one and the one next to it, public printer's office. As far as I can tell, they're the oldest existing brick buildings in Live Oak, 1894. We also have a cigar factory in Live Oak. Uh, Mr. Smith is the proprietor. I don't know his first name other than it starts with an N. So it could be Nathaniel, could be Nelly, I don't know, but Mr. Smith. And it was increasing because of the demand. He had to keep adding on to it and building to it. Other businesses moving in, and people are still continuing to move into Live Oak and are building or rebuilding because of their newfound wealth. One of the locations that you see a lot of building in this era is uh, Ohio Avenue. And this is a picture of Ohio Avenue south looking north. Um, if you want to know where it is today, the Melody Thrift Store is here. Pizza Hut is across the street. If that gives you an idea of where we are. Look at all the trees. And there's some more pictures I've got of downtown Live Oak that show all the Live Oak trees that we have. But these are some nice houses. This is the house of Captain W.J. Hillman, our first millionaire, you know, actually millionaire. Um, he lived here uh, for many decades, started as a convict camp guard in the, 18, the 1870s, I believe. Young guy. He was trying to head to Texas, and the railroad was going the other way, so he jumped off at Live Oak, and lots of fun stuff with him. But that's his, his mansion, which is now gone. The house behind that, that one there still exists. I believe it's the Hildreth house. Uh, I knew it as the Sullivan house. That's what, when, when I was growing up, Sullivan house. That one was moved when Hardy's expanded their parking lot. It's now on South 129, just up here a few blocks from where we are. The one that's sitting over there on the east side of 129, nobody's in because they keep having, I don't know, uh, some kind of issues with it. But that house is still there. But these are some of the pictures, some of the houses that were built between the 1890s and about 1915, 1920. Not just on Ohio, but also Duval had some. And Pine, Pine Avenue had a bunch built during this era also. We'll talk about some of them probably next month. And despite Live Oak no longer being one of the largest cities in the state, it was still large, but it was no longer the fifth largest city in the state. Uh, the city council was still working to make improvements. As I've already shown you, the new city hall being built. Also got some other improvements. And speaking of Mr. Dubose, this is another picture, and the one following are two pictures from Mr. Dubose. And this is showing pretty much this same area from the street, this house here is right here, you can't, it's hard to see, but that is Captain Hillman's house right there. So it's basically taken from the same part of Ohio Avenue, looking north. Again, look at all those live oak trees. Mm -hmm. Notice this is Ohio, one of the main thoroughfares. <laughs> Not much to it. <laughs> so in 1913, takes basically a before and after picture. This is before some improvements. Same location, after some improvements. So you've got better sidewalks, You've got the road more laid out, and I believe it's bricked at this point also. So it's no longer just kind of a dirt road, it's a bricked road at this point. Gus Potsdammer. If you've read any of my books, especially one of my books, I've got a whole chapter on him. He is probably one of the most interesting men you'll read about, or people you'll read about in Swanee County's history. There's still a lot of stuff I do not know about him, but I do know a lot. Interesting guy, I mean, his name, Augustus or Gottschalk Potsdamer. He ain't from around here. You can kind of figure that out. Right? <laughs> he was not originally from here. Um, he was of German descent. That's the Potsdamer and the Gottschalk, to be honest. 
He was born in 1853, it looks like. He, at some point, moved to Lake City. A you know, descendant of a German. He was also a Jew. This was a period of, of anti-Semitism in the world. This is not just a Nazi Germany thing, which doesn't exist at this point. It's all around the world. Jews are looked down upon in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. Hitler and his bunch are just kind of picking up where other folks had left off years later. So, again, by the 1870s, he lived in Lake City. The first reference I have of him is from a July 11, 1876 article in the Savannah Morning News. It says that on July 3rd, he and one of his friends, a guy by the name of George Harris, narrowly escaped drowning on one of the lakes in Lake City. If it weren't for some nearby folks, they would have drowned. So that's the first time I see him mentioned. So by th that point, he's what, 23 maybe? About drowns. Later on, I don't really see anything else of him until uh, January of 1880. By this point, he is the town marshal of Lake City. He's like the police chief of Lake City. And he and the sheriff of, Sw of Columbia County, uh, John C. Henry, uh, do not get along. They're both kind of young men, they're kind of temperamental, and they just don't get along. So the Savannah article talks about, um, let's see, in late January of 1880, they go to a performance of the Park Theater Troupe. They go to meet at a saloon after that, and I guess they get into a fight, to a quarrel. And um, that newspaper, which you can find online, talks about the fight and the mortal wounding of Sheriff John C. Henry by the town marshal, Gus Potsdamer. So, Gus Potsdamer kills the sheriff. Was it, I shot the sheriff that song? Yeah. He, he shot the sheriff and he, he killed him. The newspaper says, quote, they are both young men of reputation and promise, though both of rather rash and hasty tempers, and the unfortunate difficulty between them is regretted by the whole community. Well, Gus Potsdamer is charged with first degree murder. He is convicted of second degree murder. He had not planned this. It just, they had a fight and he killed him. He is, he is again, sentenced, uh, convicted of second degree murder, sentenced to life in prison as part of the convict uh, camp, which was in Live Oak at this point. We've talked about that in the book, American Siberia. So Gus, of German descent, who's a Jew, who's town marshal, trying to keep peace, has just killed a sheriff of Columbia County. He's found guilty. Now, the newspaper, one of the newspapers says, hey, it's kind of his, his conviction is controversial because some of the reports state, hey, Sheriff Henry started it. Sheriff Henry pulled out a gun first or a weapon first. And this was more maybe self-defense. And he was beating a Gus Potsdamer over the head with his pistol when Potsdamer got away from him and shot him. So it's very controversial. But he is still found guilty. He was also very popular. Potsdamer was very popular uh, with the town of Lake City. And it's, quote, uh, he had a reputation of city marshal who always enforced the law fairly. That's how he was seen in Lake City. But again, convicted, tried and convicted, second degree murder. He is committed to the state, based the comic camp over here. Now, because he's a Jew, and because of the instances of surrounding the murder, or the, the death, there's this issue, this concern by uh, politicians and by law enforcement that A, Jews are gonna spring him out of this, or B, uh, everybody else is going to try to kill him for having killed the sheriff. So he comes to Live Oak, and he is being uh, escorted heavily. John Powell, J.C. Powell, the guy that wrote that American Siberia book, talks about encountering Gus Potsdamer for the first time. And he says, quote, When the train from Lake City pulled in, a large crowd had assembled at the depot, and five men with shotguns first disembarked. Then came the prisoner, a frail, pallid young man, so loaded out with chains, handcuffs, shackles, and manacles of every description that he could hardly walk. And another guard of five men brought up the rear. So he's got ten armed guys wow. guarding him. 
is either they're going to try to spring them out or they're going to lynch them, depending on which group. Almost all the prominent Hebrews of the state came pouring out of the cars after this procession. So the, the new Columbia County Sheriff and the state attorney asked Mr. Powell, where's the posse that's going to take this guy back to your camp? Powell says, it's just me. So uh, he uh, basically unchains him and has him walk the four miles to the camp. He's watching them, but I mean, this is a guy, eh, I don't think it's going to be much of a problem for me. Well, Gus only serves 30 days in the convict camp before uh, his conviction is on appeal, and he is released. But later on in July of 1880, the Santa Morning News quoted the Live Oak Bulletin, which was a newspaper that we don't have anymore, says, quote, on last Monday night, Mr. Gus Potsdammer was returned to the convict camps by order of the Supreme Court, which sustained the action of the court below and refused to grant a new trial in this case. It will be remembered that the last fall term of the Circuit Court for Columbia County, Mr. Potsdammer, who had been indicted for the killing of Sheriff John Henry, was convicted of murder in the second degree and sentenced to the penitentiary for 99 years. His attorneys asked for a new trial, which was refused by Judge Cock, who was then presiding, and appeal was obtained in the Supreme Court with the result as above stated. Mr. Potsdammer has many strong friends and sympathizers, and we presume that a mighty effort will be made to, made to secure a pardon for him. Well, his friends appealed that, and eventually, after another two months, back in the convict camp, he was released. They realized, okay, it actually was self-defense. So he got off. Well, I guess because of having killed the sheriff of Columbia County, he decides maybe he shouldn't live there anymore. <laughs> so he moves over to Swanee County. He moves to Live Oak, becomes a respected businessman. Uh, actually, he is elected as city council or town councilman in 1884, and he resigns in 1886. Again, lots of resignations in the first few years of Live Oak history. Uh, incorporated history, I should say. So he resigns in 1886. While he's a town alderman, the Lake City Reporter mentions that he is really the guy pushing a movement to have telephone service established in Live Oak. Telephones had only been around for a few years by this point, and he's pushing hard for Live Oak to be one of the first towns with it in Florida. He's also mentioned 1885 by a Jacksonville newspaper called The Tropical Paradise, and at this point, he is mentioned as having a turnout service, basically a, a taxi service, especially going between Live Oak and White Springs, which was where health resorts were located, lots of motels. So he did that. He was well-liked by our community, not just before killing the sheriff in Columbia. He was well-liked in our community, again, despite being of German descent and a Jew, which was very rare. He was well-liked. He had lots of businesses. He had a livery stable. He had a billiard and pool room. He had a place called The Pastime, uh, and one of the advertisements notes, quote, refreshments for the inner system of mankind are provided there by the little brown jugs he provides to those who are coming from dry counties. <laughs> so at the time, Swanee was wet, yeah. and uh, people would come over here to get drunk at his place. He was also the first lieutenant of the Swanee Rifles, which was our local militia unit. In 1887, so he was town councilman or alderman, 1884 to 1886. 1887, he is appointed as what's called the scavenger for the town of Live Oak. Scavenger, best I can understand from what the duties were, is kind of like the sanitation director. Go pick up carcasses and things that keep the streets clean, kind of stuff like that. So he did that only for a few months because then he was uh, selected as a town marshal and tax collector of Live Oak. So, He's gone from being a, tech, a, a town marshal in Lake City to a town alderman in Live Oak to the town sanitation director of Live Oak, a town marshal and tax collector of Live Oak. And then he resigns a few months later. <coughs> Not the first. Again, th these marshals especially, it, I've got several instances reading through the minutes where they were only on it for like a week or two and then they resigned. Mm -hmm. So lots of stuff going on. It was not a popular job. So he resigns from that. So that's what we're talking about, 1887. Well, in 1889, Gus is elected as sheriff of Swanee County. He serves one term, ends in 1893. Uh, there are several instances talked about while he is sheriff. Uh, one time he had a deputy that was shot. He went all the way to Texas to track the guy down and did it. Uh, another instance in 1889, 
the Wake Forest reporter talks about it, where Potsdamer arrested a guy named Robert McCoy, who was carrying concealed weapons. Uh, McCoy told Potsdamer, quote, you have arrested me for something else than carrying a gun and can't fool me in this way. What else, asked Potsdamer. McCoy admits to a murder that he and some other guys had committed in Live Oak. Uh, Potsdamer didn't know that. They'd been looking for the killers, but had no idea. And so McCoy not only confesses to that murder, but racks out all of his other guys that were involved. And so Potsdamer, because of that stroke of luck, is able to capture all of them. Of course, most of them either executed for that or they are killed while trying to escape arrest. So uh, just because of arresting for concealed uh, weapons. So I guess he thought Potsdamer was on to him. It's like, yeah, that's not why you really arrest him. You go ahead and did it. So just one of those funny things. It's kind of like one of those, some of those movies you see, those comedy fiendish movies where the evil guy admits the, the plan. It's like, oh, I had no idea the good guy. So that's what happens. Another thing Gus Potts never ran for many years was a funeral home. Lots of advertisements for the funeral home. And he ran lots of other businesses. Again, besides that pastime, he had, most of his businesses, it seemed, he sold alcohol. This was a time when we were wet. And he sold lots of alcohol. He also purchased the town's artesian well in 1892, ran it for about five years before he sold it to Thomas Dowling. And not only that, but also the lot or the plot of land where Thomas Dowling would build his water tower. That was owned by Gus Potsdam originally. The funny thing, or one of the funny things about Gus Potsdam is despite him being a lawman, he didn't always follow the law. Lots of times he didn't follow the law. If you go through the Swanee County wreck cases, you will see his name mentioned fairly frequently in this era. Things like holding a shop without a license. And what happens is it's up at, you know, maybe it's the fall term of court. It's just postponed to the next term. Well, when the next term comes, it's postponed to the next term. This happens for several years and eventually it just kind of falls off. So he's not really uh, you know, charged and convicted of anything much, but he does have several of those happening of not having a license for his shops. He's actually convicted in 1895 of, quote, engaging in business of a retail liquor dealer without paying the special tax. He's sentenced to 30 days in the Duval County Jail, not Swanee, but Duval County Jail, and a fine of $100. That's in 1895. The weird thing is, and I don't know why, but he gets a presidential pardon for that in 1897. <laughs> the dude had some good friends. I mean, 1899 in Swanee County, he's charged with cohabitating with a woman without being married to her. So, uh, again, a lawman not always following the law. Do as I say, not as I do, right? In 1903, he becomes the first fire chief of the Live Oak Fire Department, which is why I've got that picture in there. That may or may not be him on there, I'm not sure, but anyway, may not even be Lima for that matter. Anyway, he was the first fire chief. The budget was $1,240. There was a shed on the courthouse lot on the north side, if I recall correctly, and it had two hose carts, 60 feet of fire hose, two firefighters, and then 16 volunteers. That was the first fire department. In 1913, the era we're talking about, I mean, this was a long way to get to where I'm getting to, he becomes sheriff yet again in Swanee County, elected in 1913. But he is removed from office the following year. <laughs> Lots of different issues. Uh, one of the main issues was he's misappropriated $300 that the county commission gave him to buy bloodhounds. That's like uh, you know, probably $8,000 today. <coughs> Expensive dogs but I guess not down these criminals he's looking for. But he does that, but other things that are mentioned by the state, by the governor and whatnot, whenever he is actually removed from office, is uh, he didn't enforce laws, especially when it came to alcohol sales. See, he was guilty of that a lot himself. Uh, also, he transferred fines to the, to the improper. He didn't, he didn't transfer fines to where they were supposed to. So he was removed from office by the governor, it was approved by the legislature, so he's removed from office, but he continues to live in Live Oak because I've got a note from the Platka News, a newspaper from 1915. And uh, what's going on is 
baseball season. Baseball. Live Oak and Palatka are having a series in 1915. And um, Live Oak has won the first few, but then they start losing to Palatka while they're in Palatka. But when they move back to Live Oak, for the rest of the games, Live Oak has, um, let's see if I can find how it's worded in here. It's very small. Uh, okay, the success of our club, this is from Palatka, touched the little city of Live Oak to the quick. Live Oak is baseball crazy. The only difference between their mental condition and Palatka's being that the people of that city will contribute dollars to encourage the feeling where Palatka contents itself with giving donuts. Basically, Live Oak lost a few games, and so Live Oak went and hired some professionals from Charleston. Hired, I think, five guys. Because the Palatka newspaper says at the next game, there were five new members of the Live Oak team that were apparently professionals. Now, Live Oak was already looked at as the finest aggregation of semi professional ball tossers in Florida. That's how they're quoted in this. But it wasn't good enough, so they went and hired some ringers. Well, Live Oak still lost. So Black was gloating, and one part here, see if I can find that issue, it's small handwriting. Thursday was another wet day, especially for Live Oak, where it is said that old Gottschalk Potsdammer, as he read the telegraph bulletin from Palatka, wept a continuous stream of tears and refused to be comforted. So he was apparently a big baseball fan. Yeah, Reeners hired some out of Charleston from some of the professional, <coughs> professional teams. And they still lost. Oh well. So anyway, Gus was still living here in Live Oak in 1915. He dies in 1918. He is buried over in Jacksonville at the uh, Evergreen Cemetery. There's a Jewish section, and he's buried there. I don't know why. Maybe he moved there in his last few years. Maybe there wasn't a Jewish cemetery here that, or a cemetery that allowed him to be buried here. I don't know. But regardless. One of the most interesting guys you'll read about in Swan County's history. Very lucky guy, too, in a lot of ways. Safe from drowning, safe from first degree murder, gets out of second degree murder, presidential pardons, just it's crazy. It's crazy. All right, post office. We were speaking of that earlier before the, the presentation started. In 1906, we had had a post office built just south of the courthouse on the corner of Wilbur Street and Ohio Avenue, this building here, part of which still stands today. Well, within 10 years, it's no longer big enough for Live Oak and what it requires. And so a new post office construction began in 1915. This building was used top floor as office space. The bottom floor eventually a lot of it was ripped out to become a gas station, Allen's gas station among others. Um, and then the top floor in the 70s, I believe, burned or was torn down. And so what's left of this old post, old, old post office now is just part of the first floor. But instead, we have this newer post office built 1915, 1916. Live Oak is continuing to get things better. Uh, they have introduced a sewage system. They've bricked the streets. I mentioned earlier about Ohio. Uh, they've bricked them, which helps to eliminate the problem of dust, dust caused by vehicles caused by horses that are still going around, horse and buggies, and those kinds of things. And also uh, human waste. They have started enacting some laws saying, hey, you can't have an outhouse right there by the, by the street kind of thing. Um, that's another thing, funny thing, reading through the city council minutes. Several mentions of privies being too close to this or that, or it's on the pond, you need to move it. Uh, several of the ponds. Just sit it over the pond and do your business. So you need to move it from close to the streets so people can't see that. So that's funny. Anyway, the new post office was completed, started until 2022, and the building sits empty today. Maybe somebody will buy it and it's got the money to do something good with it. Beautiful, beautiful building. Yeah, this picture was think, uh, taken in 1922, part of a postcard. These are some pictures showing its construction. Uh, it's one of the few buildings with a basement in Swanee County. So this is either pulling out part of uh, making room for the basement. Looking north, look at all those streets, those trees around the streets. Lots of trees. 
Another picture looking north, the old Presbyterian church, which is now where the old parking lot is for the post office. Uh, that's the building just north of there. So you can see them constructing this. That's that shoot you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's on the south side of there. Over there on the, the top right, live, uh, Ohio Avenue, all those live oak trees. Beautiful, beautiful. The lobby of it, population of Swanee County at this point had 20,000 people. Uh, the post office served two routes, twi or served uh, two city routes twice a day. When you go through the county records, which I love to do sometimes, this area, even though we've got all these modern structures, we've got electricity, we've got automobiles, we've got running water, we've got sewage, we've got all these municipal buildings being constructed. It's funny when you read through the, especially the court cases, because it seems like a wild west still in Live Oak, especially with Swanee County. You've got things like murders, attempted murders. You've got brawls. You've got lots of bigamy. Lots of bigamy in Swanee County for some reason. It's like they get away from their, they think they're getting away from their first spouse, move here, remarry, but they get found, found out. So uh, a lot of bigamists that were living here at the time. Uh, you've, you've got some women who are uh, running places of ill repute, i.e. houses of prostitution going on. You've got thefts of hogs, you've got thefts of cows, even gunfights in the streets. So even though it's a modern city at this point, more or less, with lots of modern things, the people are still, well, people are people. You know, kind of wild, wild west. It, it really is. With electricity and cars. And telephones. And telephones, yeah. <laughs> yes. I like the all kinds of stuff. All kinds of modern conveniences. So, 1916, we're kind of tying up this presentation as we continue the 1900-1920 deal. And this shows 1916 map of Swanee County. There are more places listed than I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. But still, there's a lot less than there used to be. And most of these are just in name only. Places like Emerson, Wilmarth, well, Wilmarth is still there, but not for long. Uh, Star, Lancaster, Platte. A lot of these are just stops on the railroad and that's it. You blink and you're past it. So a lot of people still moving into the bigger cities or the bigger communities. More railroads now. You can see several new railroads. Roads are coming in. Lots of stuff. So Swanee County is changing. So 